Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the newest episode of Triple Overtime. I am Dylan Holloway. Alongside me, as always, Austin Steiner. Our friend Amar Burton is off this week, but we have a very special guest coming to us. Lofa Tatupu, multiple-time Pro Bowler, former Seattle Seahawk, All-Pro Selection, the 35th anniversary team of the Seahawks. Austin, I know you're jacked for this. Tell me about it, brother. Oh, I'm incredibly jacked for this. I mean, it's a a lifelong dream come true. He's uh, definitely a guy that, though he may not live in the halls of Canton, you know, or, or anything along those lines. He's a guy that to me personally was just one of my all time favorite players to watch um, of old, you know, of the old Seahawks days. And um, man, it, it getting the opportunity to talk with this guy and, and get some insight um, into who he is as a person. And, and just anytime you can talk to a real true pro, you know, we're not talking about some guy that was on the practice squad for a couple of weeks. We're talking about a guy who was an all pro, who wasn't just a, an NFL player, but he played at the highest level. You know what I mean? Of the NFL, um, including in a Super Bowl as well. So um, just super excited, super duper excited and stoked and so thankful, Lofa. Uh, when you do see this, so thankful that you, you gave us the time and and uh, allowed us to get to know you a little bit. Well, Austin, before we get to that interview, let's talk some uh, NFL and, and current day. As you know, Julian Edelman just recently retired. And this is something I hadn't really thought about before, but apparently this is now a question. Is Julian Edelman a Hall of Famer? No, absolutely not. And End of discussion, like, right? Let's end it. It, it is. It is. <laughs> plain and simple. And it's crazy. So like Colin Cowherd the other day, tried to essentially say because Bill Belichick rushed as if the minute Edelman retired, he was like, oh, my God, where is my food? I need my food. I've got to make a post on Edelman. What am I going to do? As if that somehow is some key indicator that Julian Edelman's a Hall of Famer. Look, there is the Hall of Very, Very Good, and I think Edelman absolutely deserves a spot in that Hall. He is. He's a a gritty, grinded out player. Unfortunately, players like him will never make the Hall of Fame. Why? Because they do the things that you can't really account for, you know? Um, and so, yeah, you got to give him his kudos for that. But this this argument that because he's second behind Jerry Rice and everything in the playoffs is so overblown. The guy well, literally not- made, made the playoffs every single year of his career except yeah. for one. And that was the last one. I mean, of course he's going to put the numbers up. Exactly. I mean, I mean, he had a great career, but he's got less than 7,000 yards receiving. We cannot only, put what 37 receiving touchdowns or 35, 30, 36. Touchdowns? You can't put Julian yeah. Edelman in the hall of fame where you don't even have Heinz Ward in the hall of fame. You don't have right. Sterling sharp in the hall of fame. You right. cannot do this. Like, and it was funny, I was talking to Blake Chadwick, friend of the show, by the way, as everybody knows who's seen this before, and he was saying it's funny because it's almost like New England Patriot fans kind of combine Wes Welker and Julian Edelman into one guy because together they make a Hall of Fame career, right. but separated, no. Julian Edelman right. is not a Hall of Famer, and it doesn't matter. Like I know Amar was saying he thinks he's going to go in the Hall of Fame because based on perception, but perception is not a measured stat. I don't care what Patriots fans think he was so awesome and so amazing. You know what I mean? It doesn't matter. Right. Like if you put Julian Edelman in the Hall of Fame, you know who else you got to put in the Hall of Fame? You got to put Dion Branch in the Hall of Fame. Of course. His stats are almost the exact same, and they both have a Super Bowl MVP, and they both have championships, right? Of course. Yes. And, and has anyone, I, Austin, have you ever heard anybody? Patriots fan or not say, why isn't Dion Branch in the Hall of Fame? No, of course not. Because, like, just the thought of it, it like, it's, where did it even come from? What, like, he had you a big playing? game. He's had a really big David, game in the Super Derek Bowl. Carr, or, I'm sorry, is David Carr a Hall of Famer because he won a Super Bowl on the freaking bench? I mean, I, I know that Edelman had far more to do with the game than that. And he had some very historic catches, but come on, man. Like, that is such a, a slap in the face. And then all these players that had far more complete careers, but suffered from the unfortunate fact that their team wasn't as good as 
wasn't the greatest coach of all time and the greatest quarterback of all time. It didn't consist of that, as well as some of the most historically best defenses of all time ever, right? So that's a slap in the face to those guys because you think that if Calvin Johnson, if uh, uh, Randy Moss, if Terrell Owens, who was very good in playoffs for the time that he actually was in there, if um, even even uh, Sterling Sharp and and Heinz Ward to some degree, you know, he saw some playoff success as well as Super Bowl success. But yeah, Heinz Ward's numbers blow out. elements out of the water, dude. Right. It's, it, it's and it's, he's it's, also got a Super Bowl MVP, if you remember. Yeah, he has a far more complete career. So my point is, is if you take all of those guys and you give them the same opportunity to not just make the playoffs, but make incredibly deep playoff runs. They they would slaughter Julian Edelman's playoff. Numbers. Plus, they plus, would literally crush them. I by see. Hundreds. I, I see people making the argument that like, well, he was Brady's number one guy. Doesn't that mean for count for something? First of all, he wasn't Brady's number one guy. Are we just forgetting that Rob Gronkowski completely existed? Right? right, like let's not let. And second of all, and for a time, so did Randy Moss. And sec, and second of all, that's not like that doesn't gain you bonus points because you had possibly the greatest quarterback of all time throwing to you. Does oh. that that doesn't like that should to me should be almost a detriment, right? Like he had yeah, the greatest really quarterback of all time, and he has thirty six touchdowns. Right, and what happened to the constant uh, uh, talk or conversation about Tom Brady and the fact that he's the goat? Because he he has done this by taking pay cuts and letting them build the defense and no weapons on offense. He's done it with nobody's. Now all of a sudden he's got a Hall of Fame wide receiver. Are you, you think you think me? you think Brady like saw that on his phone and went, "Wow, that's news to me. I didn't know I had a Hall of Fame wide receiver that whole I mean, time." Like now all of a sudden he's got a Hall of Fame talent wide receiver that he's had his entire career that literally nobody's ever talked about one time. Dude, thir- 30, 36 touchdowns and like less than 7,000 yards. Come on, man. That's not, you can't do it. You can't. He's like, the hall. He's the it. hall of very good. Like you said, right. and there's no shame yeah. in being in the hall of very good. Some of my favorite players are in the hall of very good. Absolutely. Let's not forget Daryl, Daryl Jackson, Seattle Seahawks. He's Darryl hall Jackson. of very good. Matthew yeah. You hassle back. Yeah. Uh, uh, Lofa Tutupu, who we are about to interview. You, you could very much put in though. And uh, he had a short career. He had a very efficient and effective career. He had a, a three, four year span where he was definitely one of the top linebackers in the league at that position. Uh, uh, Sidney Rice. I mean, there's a ton of guys just from the Seahawks alone that are in that, that category. And guess what? Those are the guys that, yes, you, you still are in a position where when you tell the story of the NFL, their names come up, but just that doesn't mean that they're hall of famers. I, I it's ridiculous to try to, Brown, this guy is a Hall of Famer when he was nothing. He's he's done nothing more than ride the to- the the coattails of the greatest coach and quarterback combination of all time. Ooh, That's it. plain and simple. Yes, fighting words. Well, it's the truth. Do you think? Man. Do you think we'd even be having this discussion if there wasn't that Super Bowl against the Falcons? Probably not, because that was his MVP game, right? Uh, the Rams was. Against the Rams, he had was it the Rams? I thought it yeah, was the ten Falcons. catches for 141 uh, yards. So even the game where he made that miraculous catch, okay. Yeah. So the game with the with the Rams where there was like no offense whatsoever and it put us all to sleep. That's his like yep. claimed fame for the Hall of Fame. Yeah, absolutely. Yep, okay. No, he's definitely not a Hall of Famer just because that game sucks. <laughs> hey, ten catches for 141 yards and not a single touchdown, and he was the Super Bowl MVP. That just shows you how like much of a drought for offense that game had like those are good numbers and everything but like i don't know when you've got like tom brady and rob gronkowski and todd Gurley and all those weapons and everything it's like of just like a buck 40 and no touchdowns it's like eh, okay yeah. well and and the fact that that was super bowl mvp that just immediately tells you how terrible of a super bowl that was how just god awful of a super bowl it was 100 <laughs> percent yeah, not a good one. I all I remember from that game is uh, how boring it was, how low offense, and why the Rams were not using Todd Gurley. Right. Add it to the right. list that of was, Super Bowl mysteries. Yeah. Right, and that that was like kind of a weird. Everyone was like, "Is he hurt? Game. Is he hurt? Is he hurt?" But, but what about some other sports, Austin? Uh, how are your Seattle Mariners doing so far? 
Um, well, just like usual, we're about 500 through the season at the time of this recording, I believe just one game under 500. Um, and so they'll make a little bit of a push and stay within the, uh, the division, uh, race until about the all-star break and then it will suck. However, you know, what has also been incredibly fun to watch other than the Mariners constantly win and lose then win, then lose, then win, then lose in the most boring fashion possible the Los Angeles Dodgers. They are on fire. Oh my God, they are so good right now. They have power hitting through every part of their lineup. Um, they they are just, uh, they're crushing teams. This is one of the best baseball teams I've ever seen in my life uh, ever of watching uh, baseball, you know? And, and what's funny is it seems like I don't know if you heard, but there was a big, uh, a big story surrounding Trevor Bauer, their starting pitcher, where uh, some of his balls were actually sent to the MLB. I yeah, I he, saw that. I sent that to you. Oh yeah, okay. In that's the group right. chat. Yeah, I, <laughs> yeah, I believe that uh, it was another team that sent him whatever the. Case and he was, was pretty there. mad that they even looked yeah. into that, and he was criticizing he was the fact it. that like other players, other positions can can do stuff like that, but pitchers kind of have the microscope on them for some reason. Hey, that's the nature of the beast. Is he wrong? I mean, is he wrong? I, I, not really. I mean, yes, he he's right in the sense that they do have that microscope, but like, you think that's unfair? He, no, because you guess, guess what? The pitchers are the guys that, that it's just like quarterback in the NFL. Like you, you take all the glory when they win and, and you got to take all the heat and everything else when you lose. Yeah. And, but I think he's complaining that like pitchers are, it's like opposite of the NFL, whereas quarterbacks are protected like insanely now in the league. Pitchers yeah. are scrutinized more. Like he was saying, like specifically, uh, like batters get to have like the tacky whatever the whole to grip the bat yeah, more, whereas yeah, like uh, whereas like tar, 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 yeah whereas like a pitcher tar, like if there's off, anything yeah. on if there's anything on the ball like automatically they're sending them to the league to be analyzed like it's a forensic files episode you know what I mean like it's <laughs> yeah but you know what at the end of the day the league knows and understands that home runs are what puts the butts in the seats and yes they want to allow these guys to be able to do their job but they can't have them doing it so well that the a majority of the games that we're watching day to day are no no runs one two three run games you know um so that's where they have to get really strict because man there there is a lot of stuff that you can do to that baseball Dylan I mean there's a lot of ways that you can form it and mold it and with some dust on it or some pine tar or some spit or some uh, you know, a little bit of grass or, I mean, whatever. And the fact that these guys are throwing these things. Well, now I have to, I, I want to ask you real quick, Austin, while you're on yeah. that point, all the things you can do, right. You yourself have advocated that you think people should be the, you think athletes should be allowed to use performance enhancing drugs, right? Uh -huh. Yeah. So do you think that they should just throw that rule away then? And he can well, I, alter I the do. ball however he wants. Do you think they should get rid of the rule? Like, I know you're saying that's the rule and I understand right. that, but do you think that they should get rid of that rule then? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. hundred percent. I think it's ridiculous. I think if these guys are, are, I think that it would be even more fun to watch these, ball, the ball just literally go from 12 to six, like in the, just like that. I mean, and watching guys getting all twisted up and well, it would be like watching like NFL blitz with baseball in real life. Like the, just all the batters would be all jacked up and juiced up, bro, looking like Barry Bonds times 100. And then all the pitchers are just throwing these ridiculous balls that are going on all corners before crossing the plate. It'd be awesome, dude. I, I would love it. What, what do you think the percentage is? In your opinion, what do you think the percentage is of players in the MLB Major League Baseball right now that are juicing? Oh, gosh. I'd say probably. You had to guess. 5%. You think it's at least half? No, I think it's like five to ten percent, to be honest. You think only ten percent of players in baseball are juicing? Yeah, man. I mean, there's the guys who get caught, but at the end of the day, those guys are under, especially baseball, because of the huge. I mean, dude, it went to like what is it, the public opinion court or whatever, Supreme Court. Uh, uh, I mean, so yeah, Supreme Court's are, higher than the public opinion court, just for anyone out there that's listening. Yeah, morning. right. Um, <laughs> you can't go to public it. opinion jail, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
My point being is that baseball was under a huge microscope for so long because of steroids. And so um, I just, I, I don't think that that many guys are willing to take the risk. I just yeah, don't. it's interesting. I, I myself have no idea. Like I've stated on the show before, I'm not as big a baseball fan as you are. But I know it is like a huge deal to especially like a lot of the old school guys who watch baseball, people doing right. steroids so and all that kind of thing. Right now is that and it the felt like they're talking about it so much that it feels like it's higher in baseball than it might be in other leagues. But that's probably not true, especially with like football, stuff like that. What's funny to me, though, Austin, is you almost never hear about it with basketball like the NBA. I uh-huh. think the only player I ever heard about getting popped for steroids was the Birdman years ago. Well, you know, the NBA doesn't <laughs> uh, test for HGH, right? It doesn't. The NBA. Well, isn't that funny, though? The, the one guy who's ever like, are we supposed are we supposed to believe that the one guy who's ever in steroids in the NBA is the Birdman? Yeah, of course. Obviously. <laughs> The one dude. Because he was trying to. Uh, never mind, and, I and I don't remember exactly what he was doing, but it was an older story. But I just always thought that was funny that he's like the one guy. You know? I, I, if I had to bet, I would say probably 80% of the NBA is including the biggest stars in the NBA are using some form of supplement or something or another that if it were in the MLB or the NFL, they would get suspended for performance enhancing. It seems like the NFL's, it seems like the NFL's really strict on that kind of stuff too. Oh yeah. Like the supplements, and we're not even talking steroids here, folks, or like HGH or anything. We've seen so many stories of guys getting popped for a supplement they took that they bought it like, uh, at like, a like a, a, a normal supplement store. You know what I mean? Yep. Like, yeah, and they, and they didn't the, see the exact ingredients. Well, even if you look yeah. like sometimes you got to be a chemist to know exactly what's in this stuff and what it's going to do. And like, I'm sure they got a list of rules and everything like that. But like, if you're just working out, like sometimes you don't, maybe like a buddy was like, here, try this or something. You know what I mean? So stuff happens. Right. You know, I know they're responsible for everything that goes in their bodies kind of thing, but sometimes they think it's a little ridiculous just how strict they get on that kind of stuff i agree all right folks we're gonna take a quick commercial break we don't have any sponsors we're gonna hear from somebody and when we come back lofa tutupu seattle seahawks legend you're not gonna want to miss this we'll be right back And we are back. Um, we have a huge, amazing, incredible special guest joining us here on Triple Overtime. He is a multiple time pro bowler, uh, all pro selection in 2007, a two time national champion with the USC Trojan. Please welcome today our very own Seattle Seahawks legend, a part of the 35th anniversary team. I can't gush enough about it, uh, Lofa Tatupu. Thank you so much, Lofa, for joining us today. Yeah, man. Uh, thanks for the kind words and appreciate you guys having me on. Now, Lofa, uh, I want to get right into it here. Uh, what do you miss the most about playing in the National Football League? That's a good question. You know, I mean, competition, I love that aspect of it. But I think when you ask, you know, most of the guys what they miss, it's it's the the brotherhood and, um, you know, being together and being part of something bigger than yourself. So, you know, being part of a team and uh, that quest for the championship, that's, you know, that's really what's most special about the game. And anytime a guy walks away, he says, man, I missed the locker room. I missed being around my brothers. Gosh, I could imagine, man, you guys, uh, especially, you know, making that trip to Super Bowl 40 like you guys did. That was such an incredible team. And uh, Dylan and I both, you know, we watched every game from start to finish. And you guys, uh, gosh, just overcame a lot that season, you know. And so I could imagine that that brotherhood and that bond that you uh, you build going into something like that, you know, and getting through the playoffs and everything. So now moving into past your life of the NFL, what would you say are some of the best and worst things about being retired? Um, 
I would say best and worst is the time you have, you know, because <laughs> if, if you have, if you don't have another passion that, um, you know, you were either working towards or, or maybe even did some internships, which I never really did. And again, you know, they tell you that the NFL stands for not for long. And <laughs> I mean, we know I had three great seasons and then injuries just took me out of the game. And so um, when it happens like that quickly, it's tough because you, I've always been a guy that's had a plan. Okay. Well, when this happens, I'm going to do this. And that's what, that's the life and the mentality of a middle linebacker is always pivoting audible, like let's go. And Quarterback so, of the defense. Yeah. Yeah. And so when football ended so abruptly, you know, after my, my sixth, seventh really season, um, just really t- took a step back and thought about, you know, what do I love? And um, luckily, you know, the first thing that came to mind was football. And so I got back into it two, two and a half years after I was out of it in 15 and 16. And I coached uh, the linebackers uh, under Michael Barrow here. That's incredible. Yeah, that's, uh, I, and you know, that's the thing I could imagine is with most players, uh, is coaching kind of a thing that, that a lot of players pivot to, you know, after, because like you said, you guys, you spend your entire life every I mean, probably from the time of high school or whatever the case, like NFL, I got to get to the league. I got to make it to the league. And then when you're in the league, it's I got to win a Super Bowl or, you know, you've got certain things you want to accomplish. So when you're retired and have all that extra time, um, yeah, is coaching just like the most obvious next step? Well, it's I mean, I've been working towards the NFL since I was seven years old and I played until you know, I was 30, 31. And so you know, I'm 38 now. So there's, you know, like I said, just the first seven years of my life, I wasn't really around football, but I was because I'm second generation NFL. My dad played for the Patriots for 13 years. And um, so with that being my background and, you know, really when a guy is working his whole life with that goal in mind, it's um, it's something easy to transition into because you love it. You know it. You're an expert in the field, you know, so it's. it's an easy transition because, you know, you really, I really, when I was coaching and I was just an assistant, so it wasn't like I was the linebacker coach or a D coordinator who makes a ton of money, really, you know, it's like, you're, you're doing it because you love it at the assistant level. And, you know, eventually you hope to, to go on. And, um, and I would have loved to go on, but um, my, my two kids, they were uh, six and three at the time. Now they're, you know, 10 and, and six. So maybe, few more years I could maybe see a return to football in some capacity I'm waiting for it yeah we'd we'd love to see it back on the Seahawks (laughs) if that's where uh that's where it takes you but uh we're talking about your dad a little bit before went on the air mostly to to Tupu you know shout out Mosey's mooses I was watching some highlights of him earlier today (laughs) just watching him truck over guys run through guys they said like third and short he was a guarantee uh, obviously you probably loved watching your dad play football, probably felt like it was destiny for you to go to the NFL watching him who, besides your father, who were some of your favorite players growing up though, in the NFL? Well, I thought I was a running back because he was a running back. So when I was little, you know, I played running back for a couple of years, but, um, and so besides him, Thurman Thomas, uh, from the Buffalo bills is my favorite player of all time. If we're talking, you know, just, you got to choose one player. Right. And, um, Cause he, he did it all. I mean, he could run between the tackles. He could catch out of the backfield. He could pick up the blitz. It's rare that you find a guy that can do everything. And then I really, as a linebacker, that's kind of like what I was. I didn't really have one area of expertise, um, but I was well adept in probably all of them rushing the passer, um, running stunts for a blitz coverage um, and, uh, and even run stuffing. Um, I, I did got the job done. So that's kind of the guys that I really patterned my game after were complete players. And, um, and then when you look, when I got to like high school and I realized, you know, I'm probably going to be a linebacker if, uh, if I'm going to make it. And uh, I, I was watching, you know, the greats, the junior Seau, um, you know, Ray Lewis, Erlacher, Zach Thomas, um, even a, a lot of smaller guys too, London Fletcher, Dexter Copley, Dat Wynn, um, because, you know, that's, it was, that was my body type and my skill set. So I, I was like, how are they making it? How are guys that are five, 11, six feet make an impact in the NFL? And because they could do it all. 
Yeah. And, and make an impact you did, you know, as someone who definitely was a very, very avid fan of not just the Seahawks, but yours in general, you know, um, you always have been one of my all time favorite Seahawks right up there with the Matt Hasselbeck and Sidney Rice. And, uh, just, you guys have great personalities and, and your play on the field, you know, it was gritty. Uh, and it was something where just what you said encompassed it all. You were a guy that was a sideline to sideline linebacker. You could stop the run. You're making a blush, Austin. Come on. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm gushing. Um, but but in, in moving forward, we are you coming could fill up. an hour just doing that, Loaf. Trust yeah, me. No kidding. I apologize. <laughs> this guy would be everywhere. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, no, okay. just this is this is a dream come true, to be perfectly honest, man. You really, uh, and Dylan can tell you, have I – all time definite favorite player, you know, growing up watching you play. So uh, right. thank you so much again for being here. Um, but moving forward, we're, we're coming up on the NFL draft, you know, and as someone who's gone through that process yourself, which would you say is was more nerve wracking for you? Was it waiting to be drafted or waiting for the kickoff of your very first NFL game? Uh, the entire process from me making the decision because I left a year early. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we were coming off of two national titles. You know, I wasn't going to get any bigger. I wasn't going to get taller or any faster. You know, it's just, it's like make a decision. And, you know, another, another hundred tackles wasn't going to get me drafted in the first round. So strike while the iron's hot. You know, my stock was high. At least I thought as high as it could go. And um, I made the jump when everybody said, yeah, you're probably not going to get drafted. That's the stuff I was hearing. And I had confidence in myself and belief in what I did was enough to, to make it to the next level and get drafted. And I told them, Hey, all I need is a chance. I just need an opportunity. And I'll, I'll show you. Even, even if I uh, get last pick or if I go, you know, undrafted, if I make a camp, I'm making the team. That's, that was just my, my mentality or my, my thought process. And then you remember when I got drafted, the Hawks took a lot of heat. Uh, oh yeah. Tons. Traded up, traded up <laughs> yeah. Pick. yeah, two picks to, to move up a couple spots and, and pick an undersized, slow middle linebacker from Southern California. They seem to emphasize slow every time they brought up your name, too. <laughs> right. Oh, absolutely. Like, come on, man. Yeah. <laughs> Which is you're crazy crawling to make tackles. <laughs> yeah, we, we saw a guy that, yeah, could hit hard. And especially when you got to the league, I would say you were definitely one of the more athletic linebackers. You know, to me, I feel like your blueprint as a linebacker is a big reason why Pete Carroll uh, made the decision to draft Bobby Wagner when he did. You know, it. I think it's very comparative games, you know. It is, but, but Bobby, you know, he's probably like a half a second faster. I'm not even lying. Like, I think he's a 4'4", four four, and I was a 4'8". Oh, yeah. Yeah. So there's, well, let's see, and now we see the difference on, you know, on top of the injuries, but we see the difference between a very good player, pro bowl player and a hall of fame player. Right. <laughs> oh, without a doubt. Well, we know you're being humble Lofa, but there's no doubt you did change the dynamic of the Seahawks defense at that time. Cause they were not known for defense, especially under Mike Holmgren. And I've read a lot about how you went in there and you kind of changed the whole mentality of the defense by being a first guy in last guy out type of thing. You studied film religiously and just your leadership really showed out there, even as a rookie, when you went to the Super Bowl. Yeah. I, you know, I just came in, I wanted to keep my head down and just grind as you know, much as I possibly could and earn the respect and trust of my teammates, which ultimately led to being selected captain at the, for the playoff run. And um, that's my greatest achievement. I tell everybody to this day, six years in the NFL, six years captain, six time captain. And um you know, it's um, it's something that I just will forever be grateful for. And um, and yeah, man, it's um, I, I think the little things that I was doing, getting guys together to do film study. I don't think a lot of guys did that in college, especially because, you know, I, I was hanging out with a lot of the rookies at first. And then um, uh, so all of a sudden, you know, some of the vets are like, man, this could make it a lot of plays. And some vets actually asked me, yo, like, what would you see here or what would you do here? And so you just share that knowledge and, um, you know, you have to earn, earn that respect. And so I think that's how I did it by just being one of the hardest workers. Um, and, you know, when you got a, a 5'11", 240 pound middle linebacker that almost everybody on the defense is bigger then you don't want him to out hit you. Like you, yeah. <laughs> when he makes a big hit, 
everybody else seemed to, to you know come up with a big hit of their own because they're like man this this little guy oh yeah <laughs> yeah as someone who only stands five foot six feet tall as a grown 30 year old man i i get that low but you know um, and that's it's not the side of the dog in the fight man yeah, yeah, and and I played football growing up as well, you know, and and it was the same kind of thing. Uh, at the high school level, was the peak of my career as it was for most. But um, yeah, I mean, if if I laid someone out, you know, most typically it wasn't so much a high five to me than a why would you let the short guy put you on your back, you know? So and I mean, they, that's what they they said that you know about me. But it's funny how you know after. After that rookie year or the second year, when I followed up with another solid year, um, you know, like the short, the slow still stuck around, but the short, you know, it kind of kind of faded away. I didn't see it. Oh, yeah. Because of, oh, yeah, he's, he's, you know, too short. But the it's thing is, in, it's built in leverage. But, <laughs> but the thing is, Lofa, you picked off a lot of passes. You were deadly in pass coverage. So if you're slow, what does it say about like, the guys that you're covering, do they, are they like, Oh man, I let the guy who the slow short linebacker. Hey, and I see some of those returns too, buddy. You got moving at that point. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's probably the most fun. I mean, the big hit is the most, I mean, addicting feeling just hearing the crowd. Ooh. Oh, uh, I can but, yeah, man. You hear 60,000, just like, Ooh, you know, yeah. I got, I got it. Yeah. yeah. And, but you know, a sack, you know, an interception. When you get that ball, anytime you get that ball in your hands and you get to, you know, pretend that you're a running back or I was a quarterback in high school. So, like, you just get to relive those days. I mean, it's fun because especially if you don't do anything with it, uh, you're going to hear it from the whole, all your boys. Like, man, you were, you were probably terrible in high school. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'll never forget uh, the game in 2007 where you picked off, I think it was A.J. Feely, like three different times against the Eagles, just screaming at my TV, you know, at the end of that game. You, you had like two picks in the first half, I think it was, and you set up touchdowns, and then you had the final one to seal it off. And I never seen a game like that from a middle linebacker where it's like you almost put the whole team on your back that day, it felt like. Yeah. It was, it was a fun day. Uh, it was it was really just a fun win because I think we clinched the playoff berth with that. I think it was like a 10th or 11th game of the season. Mm -hmm. And that's really what it's all about. Like I said, going back to the first question, you know, what you miss the most is your brothers and the, and the, and the journey. So, um, but I still, it was crazy because after that game, you know, um, famous linebacker, Dave Wyman, played for the Hawks. He came up to me, he was now a reporter, you know, and he was covering the game. And he said, I don't think I've ever seen a middle linebacker have a game like that. And I like, you know, I looked up and I had talked to Dave a couple of times before. And, um, you know, I told him, I was like, man, I missed two tackles. And I think I could have had a fourth interception. And <laughs> the other tackle was a sack. So I would have filled the whole stat sheet, you know? So oh, that'd be great. It's that's the, and, uh, we, we always joke about it. That's the, the tortured existence of a middle linebacker is, you know, it could always be better. How do we get better? And that that's, you know, that's what I, I live. I live for is just getting better. Well, yeah. Lofa, it, go ahead. Go ahead Austin. Uh, I was going to say, well, Lofa, uh, let's talk about the Seahawks a little bit in the modern day here. So I know that you follow the Seahawks closely. You have your own podcast where you talk Seahawks football. What do you think the Seahawks are going to do in the draft this year? Or what do you want them to do in the draft this year? Man, I think we got to get some big bodies. I mean, you know, like whether it's the O line or the D line. I and I, I, I talked about this last year because I thought last year was probably the deepest we looked depth wise on a team. You know, com comparative to the thirteen run and fourteen. You know, where you had D line stacked, O line stacked. It's uh, so oh, yeah. if we could get back to those days and you know make Russ's life a little easier in terms of just a consistent ground game because when Chris Carson wasn't in there, they, no defense was, they weren't even putting, you know, seven in the box. They were like, Oh man, we're just going to double, you know, both of these receivers, you know, Lockett and, uh, and Metcalf and good luck. And yeah. so and that, that's tough duties, man. So uh, I think if they can get that, you know, maybe an offensive lineman or two. And I mean, I like the signings we got on defense, bring a lot of the guys back, especially Dunlap. That guy really changed the trajectory of our season. When Huge. He came in, yeah, when John got him at the trade deadline, I mean, it's just typical John. That's what John does, man. Best GM in the game. And um, we went from like second to last or 
or 29th in, in sacks by week six or seven to in the top five to end the season or something like that. It was, it was insane. Oh yeah. Well, and, and they uh, went from being on pace to be literally the worst defense in NFL history, history. only giving up 16 points a game, which was right on par with the Legion of Boom days. You know what I mean? So oh, that's oh, a total turnaround. As a former yeah. Seahawk, was that hard for you to listen to? That even though you're not on that team, they're like, this is going to be the worst defense in the history of the game. Yeah, man. I mean, that, I'm once a Seahawk, always a Seahawk. And so I'm like, I'm like, man, I can't. And, you know, I can only imagine because, you know, Bobby Wagner, KJ Wright, two of the most, I got to coach those guys, two of the most competitive guys I've ever been around. And yeah. I can't imagine, you know, how many sleepless nights they had mm-hmm. uh, just thinking about that. And like every week, like trying to correct something and, and still, 40 points getting put up, you know, it was just like, that had to be maddening. And so I'm glad they, you know, we, we got healthy at the right time. Jamal came back, um, added like nine sacks of his own. And, uh, and so it really, you know, I, I'm, I'm excited about, you know, going forward. It's tough to lose Shaq. Um, you know, love, love both Shaq and Shaquille, man. They are great people off the field too. Um, but I knew we weren't going to be able to afford him. And uh, I'm just hoping, hope we get KJ right back right now. So you, you kind of made mention of John Schneider and uh, speaking of just some of these offseason moves um, in leading up to this uh, interview here, I was watching some of your content as well. And uh, in one of your Instagram posts, you made mention that you had a pretty good relationship with John Schneider and that kind of led into you coaching with the Seahawks. Um, so I guess my, my big question here is, is what does make that guy – so insanely good at his job. I mean, yes, we did lose some key pieces this year uh, in the off season, but they also re-signed and traded for amazing pieces uh, on the offense. They brought uh, Chris Carson back. They bought, brought Garrett Everett in. Uh, the trade for Gabe Jackson is a huge one. Mm. I mean, really went to work to give Russell Wilson what you know it sounds like it sounded like he was asking for. Um, so I, I mean, as someone who spent time with him as a coach and and have it has or had a good relationship with him, what makes that guy uh, tick? I mean, why is he able to find just all these little nooks and crannies of just gold? You know, it's crazy yeah. to me. I mean, his time in Green Bay, I would point to. You know, um, they drafted a lot of great players over there when he was there, and um, and so I think you know he just. He's a student of the game and the evaluation sense of things. And so, and I think his ability to know the value that's that a person or player holds, whether it's position, uh, skill set, and how they fit into the scheme, because uh, him and I'd say him and Pete, they're very, very similar in their approach to, you know, competition. You know, the you're only strong as your weakest link. So, I mean, even the weakest link on that team is a starter most other places. And that's what you oh, yeah. continue to see. And you see when, when final cuts are made, whose guys are taken first. They're always, they're always grabbing our practice squad players. They're grabbing oh, the guys we released because they just, John and his, his, his squad of, uh, of scouts, they just do a, a better job. I think of evaluating what they need and, and how the player fits in because they hit in every draft. I thought that 2010 draft, you know, and I still do. I'm still partial to him because that was my last year here with them. Right. Um, you know, Russell Ocon, then Earl, then Golden Tate. Um, I think EJ Wilson, who just, he got hurt. He, he hurt his hand and then hurt his knee. But that guy was a stud. Um, Cam Chancellor, maybe you heard him. Uh, Walter Thurman. Um, and then there was uh, two other guys, another guy, Dex, Jameson Collins and Dex Davis at the very end who was the player of the year in the Pac-12 uh, Pac at the time. And if that guy didn't tear his hip, I'm telling you, he, he would have just been wrapping up his career with the Hawks right now, I guarantee you. That's how good that kid was. And that's a seventh rounder. And then not to mention, they always find a free agent or two, right? I mean, and then right. the, late, the, late, the late picks have been really kind to them because they find just football players, Chris Carson, Sherm. Um, I mean, it goes on and on. And it's, but I say I say that that with all those great names we got we got in that 2010, everyone's looking at 2012 as the greatest in probably franchise history when you got Bruce Irvin, Russ, and uh, 
and Bobby right there in that, in that one draft. That's incredible, right? And they yeah, took, when heat, you they took heat for that draft too, though, Lofa, remember? They, they got an F. <laughs> they got an yeah. F for that draft. Yeah. <laughs> the picks that, yeah, those three picks too, the first three picks, they took heat on each one of them. Yep. And they just yep. paid that win. And, you know, they brought Russ in in the third round. And, you know, they're like, you just paid a franchise quarterback or so, you know, the media thought. Yeah, Matt uh, Flynn. Was, yeah, because yeah, of his time in Green Bay. And, and Matt Flynn's a great quarterback. But, you know, this is the spirit. This is the whole ethos and philosophy of John and Pete's system, competition. And the best player is going to play. And so, like, I mean, it's incredible. That's it's, it's what happened when I was at SC with Pete. We saw it time and time again, a guy who was a five, five star recruit, you know, big name. And then you see, you know, a transfer from University of Maine starting. Right. And, right? So, so um, I'm, I'm proof of, of Pete's, you know, system or, or philosophy. And, and that's that's how you win. You just you got to keep getting better. Right. Well, and you got to, it's just like anything else in life, you know, it, it, you've got to find places to be, to be the best that nobody else is looking, right? You got to find areas that, hey, that I can't just be good at, but exceed and be the absolute best and legend at that nobody's even thinking about at this point, you know, hence why we've seen so many teams take that Seahawks blueprint of taller, long, lengthy uh, cornerbacks and, uh, uh, you know, we, we've got guys like Kyler Murray, Baker Mayfield going number one overall, you know, due to the success that you've seen out of Russell Wilson. I, I mean, it's just crazy what the Seahawks organization, it's got its fingerprints all over the league, you know. Um, but it, so m- moving forward from that, now we saw, obviously, the Seahawks especially were a team that opted not to have a crowd over the last uh, uh, NFL season here. Um, now, as someone who, you know, has played in, in that Seahawks stadium, especially being considered one of the loudest, just, you know, I've been to games myself, the energy there is just so incredible. Um, I mean, how much of a difference would you say it makes good or bad um, playing without a crowd in that stadium? Oh, man, it's tough. It's tough duties. It's, it's home field advantage because, you know, you rely on the crowd that it is the 12th. I don't know if they change it 12th person. You know, I want to be. <laughs> I think it's just 12s now, Lofa. The 12s, yeah, 12s now. The 12s. That's... <laughs> the 12s, man, you can't, you can't hear anything out there. And like, that's what I attribute a lot of these quarterbacks throwing for 400 yards, not just on us, but there was like, there was like six or seven 400 yard games each week to start the season, right. you know? Um, and that's because now these quarterbacks, they can get to the perfect play. Okay, I see what they're in. Here comes the check. Well, when that clock's ticking, the play clock, and they can't hear, and like you got guys looking back and forth, like, wait, did he change it? They're questioning themselves. That's when you know we make the big play. That's when right. we see them mess up and you know shoot a gap on a run or or make a play on a, a throw. But you know he didn't have any of that. And and I think you could argue because Tampa did have towards the end of the season. They did have some fans at their home game. They had like half, not half, or you know, fifteen or twenty thousand. Same with Kansas City. And Kansas City was winning, but but Tampa had to reel off a lot of wins late in the season to make that playoff push. So yep. you could argue that that really you know propelled them. You know, and that's that's the twelves. It's the greatest fan base, and I'm not just saying that because I played here. I watched them damn near win the Giants game for us in 05. <laughs> I mean, yep, I was on, one of my I favorite terrible. games of all time. Yeah. <laughs> the 10 false starts or 10 penalties, you know, uh, it was incredible. And I mean, that we, we needed every one of those to force overtime. Um, Giants were pretty good. I remember that. And uh, and then luckily, Josh Brown hit a you know a game winner again, like he always does. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that that game was uh Gosh, I, I probably would have. I think I had about two or three heart attacks. Dylan, I think you and I watched that game together. That was uh, it was, was Jay, Fe- Jay Feely missed like two or three field goals in overtime, and each one you yeah. were like, Oh, yeah, we right. were doing the Sanford and Son each time in our living rooms, Lofa. You know what I mean? Like, 
<laughs> so um, I can only imagine what it's like to be a player watching, you know what I mean? But can you speak a little bit to that energy that the fans bring? Like, how do you feed off of that? And like, cause it seems to us as fans watching, it feels like you can see the momentum shifting sometimes when the fans get louder, the defense makes a play. Maybe somebody like Marshawn Lynch makes a run, you know, maybe you make an interception, the fans get louder and it just feels like you can just see like the, 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 the momentum shifting and then the Seahawks just become unstoppable. Can you feel that in person when it happens? Damn right. Energy is transferable, fellas. I mean, that oh, is yeah. a fact. I mean, you've been around someone that's happy, all of a sudden you're happy. You've been around someone who's sad, you feel, you bring down, come down a little bit, you know, and feel for them. But when the 12s are yelling and screaming at the top of their lungs, I can barely talk at the end of the game because I'm, I'm trying to get my checks out over them. You know, they're quiet for the offense. They're loud for us. And right. uh, it's just, man, it's, it's a long day's work. I'll say that much. And so, um, but that energy, man, when, when a big hits made a big play there, there's nothing like it, man. It's, it's incredible. Oh, I, I could imagine. I mean, 60, 64,000 people roaring and, and cheering for you, especially. And, um, yeah, like I said, I've been to games myself and, and you can definitely feel it in the stadium, but to be right. right in that bowl, like, like to be the center of all that attention. Oh my gosh. I couldn't imagine. That's, that's crazy. Yeah. When, and when that, the, the flag gets raised, you know, cause that's a special, uh, like celebration or ceremony now, uh, it's a ritual at every game, every home game, they raise that 12 flag and, uh, and everyone just goes nuts. Places rocking. What's the biggest difference between coaching under Pete Carroll and playing under Pete Carroll, you'd say? Mm. He makes you play basketball with him. When you coach with him or when you play for him? <laughs> oh, I should not, fellas. I, I'll be in my cubicle. Well, well, no, yeah, not when you're playing for him. He'll try to lure you over to play, you know, in the field. Right. House. <laughs> he, he has a hoop in the field house, but man. <laughs> I was at my desk and I got like a stack of player reviews to go through, you know, for, for draft. And uh, he comes over, he's just dribbling the ball next to my cubicle. And I'm like, and he's like, what are you doing? I was like, Pete, you know what I'm doing. You just gave me all this, you know, work. Like, was he chewing gum too? Was he like, no, I'm not like, of course, as he's he was dribbling. Gum. <laughs> of course he was. So, you know, I'm like, he goes, Hey man, just, you know, do a couple of them and then, you know, let's go play. And I was like, no, nah, man, this, it was a pretty big stack. I had to watch a lot of players. And, you know, it was due in a couple of days. And so, um, you know, sure enough, he comes, circles back. He's going to every other cubicle, too. And he's like, what's up? You know, and, and he comes back like an hour and a half or an hour later. He comes back and he says, he goes, all right, we need one. And at that point, you know, you can't let the squad down. Uh, I got something jumped up on my on my screen my screen is that good we good yeah yeah okay and so i finally you know i gave up i was like all right let's go play but i mean i remember him <laughs> he came to our defensive team meeting room so all the coaches were going over practice everything and uh you know again you just hear that ball bouncing down the hall and so chris richard locks the door <laughs> <laughs> what he locks the door <laughs> oh yeah chris Chris is in the middle of going through the whole, like, you know, and Chris, Chris don't play games. You know, he get your work done. Like let you, we, you know, he, I'm not going to. If I closed it. my eyes and didn't know that I was talking to Lofa Tatupu from the Seattle Seahawks, I think that you were describing an episode of the office. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's what you can put it as. So, so, you know, like I said, Chris, like he grinds, he wants to get in get it done, knock it out and, and see where we can improve. And like, there's probably 30 minutes left in this meeting and Pete's dribbling the ball. He's first, he's hand, jiggling the handle. He's like trying to get in, but it's locked. And then the next thing you know, we just hear, do, 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 do. he's dribbling the ball off the, and Chris Richard lost it. He was like, hey, he's like, all right, just get out of here. Like, oh, you get out of here. <laughs> and you know, and Pete, Pete sneaks, sneaks his head and he's like, I only need, I only need three, <laughs> three players, right? And, and Chris was like so fed up. He was just like, nah, it's whatever, coach. And like, you know, so we we, we came back. And we went to Chris and we're like, yeah, you, you sure? He's like, just get out of here. Just leave. Just, just. <laughs> I'm over it. Sounds, like, uh, sounds like it was a fun working relationship, though. Like, 
Oh, it's it's incredible. I mean, because I mean, they they grind, man. They go hard in terms of work. And uh, but then the off season when you can, you know, he'll he'll cut people loose on on Friday earlier. He's like, hey, you know, time to get out. You know, at noon or like one. You know, it's like like a half day. And you know, it's like we're all family, so we appreciated that. And and John, that's that's really also on top of their philosophy is like, yo, get in, you know, get your shit done and then, you know, just be a pro. And if you handle your business, you know, you know, go home and spend time with your family, you know, the off season we're talking. So right. that's, I mean, you're not going to find a better staff, at least I don't think to be a part of because they do it the right way. And then, I mean, they know how to grind, but they know how to do it, you know, without wearing you out, just like exhausting. You. Oh yeah. I mean, it, it, especially so I sell cars for a living and it's kind of a similar philosophy where you, you get really caught up in, uh, in just work, 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 you know, where you're working six days a week or, or more. And, and uh, from the minute you wake up to the minute you go home and just put your head on the pillow. And so having a boss or having, you know, management that's in place that, that can uh, help you prioritize, you know, spending time with your kids and, and I've got three boys and I'm married myself, you know, so being able to spend as much time with them, that, that's super important, you know, so, and we all want to like make as much money as we can by doing the littlest amount of work in terms of time, right? Because we want to be able to make those memories and spend. So that's really cool. That's, that's awesome to hear that they have that kind of environment there. Yeah, uh, I have a dog, but uh, <laughs> moving on, <laughs> speaking of the NFL... Speaking of the NFL offseason, uh, <laughs> besides the Seattle Seahawks, what NFL NFL offseason moves have been the most surprising to you, Lofa? I was really shocked when uh, McVay traded Goff for Stafford. And I'm going to say this because Matt Stafford is 0-3 in the playoffs. And, you know, you have to take that into consideration. And he's not young he's like was he 33 34 something? i think yeah no 32 or 33 yeah, yeah. 32 33 i, I mean, think he's right not... at russ's age which it's sounds right. weird because yeah. it feels like he's been in the league for 20 years but yeah like he has been <laughs> in the league well and he's yeah. a guy who's dealt with a lot of injuries too you know i mean he's yeah. had to shoulders and like major ligaments Rib, and thumb, so, yeah everything you know? yeah and um i mean they always gave him weapons in detroit I mean, Megatron, right. Golden Tate. Calvin Johnson. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Golden Golden, yeah, Golden uh, Tate was in the prime of his career when he went over yeah. to Detroit. He caught a hundred, like 99 or 100 catches his first season. So yeah. um, they drafted two for e Ebron and, and Pettigrew even before yep. him. They gave him weapons. So it's not, you know, my question is, you know, what kind of leader is he? Because every year, you, yeah, you're putting up stats, but the team's not making it to the playoffs. And I know it's not just on him. I'm not, I'm not saying that, but the guy you just shipped, he actually came into our house with a broken thumb and, and made enough plays to beat us. Yeah. You know? Right. When he wasn't even supposed to be the starter, his own coach didn't want him to play, man. Yeah. Think tough. about, the, I don't think most fans can think, can fathom the mental state that he might've been in when the coach is like, I don't want you. Yeah, and you have to come right. in and win the game. <laughs> We're gonna take this dude that we just signed a week ago. You know. Yeah, right. his own coach didn't want him, man. Yeah, you got is... like, what's going on? You're like, yeah, because like, I mean, you would think that, but that's where you would think Goff, if if he was not hampered by it, because I mean, you saw some of those balls he threw were terrible, but you know, he, he made enough plays. He got long one to cup, and you know, he made a couple other nice throws. But um, you would have hoped to hear as your quarterback that he went to the coach and said, no, I'm playing. Right. And you're like, you can't, right. you're not taking me out of this game. I'm playing. But that was the most surprising. I, I would say, um, I'm trying to think what, what other moves did you guys have any ones that surprised you? I think JJ Watt to the Cardinals just because they said he wanted to go to a contender. And I never thought of the Cardinals as a contender necessarily. Maybe it's the Seahawks right. fan in me, but I was like the Cardinals. I for thought, I for sure <laughs> thought he was the Titans or the Steelers for him. I thought Steelers because the you know, his brothers are there, but yeah. then I thought Green Bay was the one. Yeah. I was like, yeah, he's going home, and uh, you know, join I'm them. I'm right there with you on Matt Stafford though, and yeah, I wrote this home because I remember Dan Orlovsky of ESPN was saying like, book it Super Bowl because Stafford's there, and I was like, 
what what is this what is he basing this off of you know what yep. i mean like it didn't Arnie make spaniard said the same thing he was like this it makes them an instant super bowl contender they were the they were the third best nfc team last year and blah blah and i'm like i don't because and, and lofa you could I, I would imagine you could speak on this and attest to this but when it comes to just any sport in general, and especially at the level, like the pro level that you played at, Stafford at, everything, like some guys are just winners and some guys aren't, you know, and, and especially coming from that leadership role. I mean, there's guys out there that may not have all the fancy stats and everything, but damn it, they just know how to get it done. They know how to win, you know. Uh, Tim hey, Tebow, was, to me, was a perfect example of that. Tebow, remember the name Taylor Heineke. Now, Washington's probably going to draft somebody and make him the second string. Or wait, wait, they signed Fitz too, didn't they? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. 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 So they're, Fitz is going to win that because he's going to win over the locker room like he has every other place. Of course. He, he is a good quarterback. I'm not taking anything away from Fitz. But I think the fact that he's like he's like a real dude, even though he went to Harvard, he's a real dude. He's a guy you'd want to have a beer with, right? Yeah. That's what it comes down to. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and then, you know, you get the fix magic every now and then. And so that, that just adds more to the hype. But it's, um, I've been saying since the kid came out of Old Dominion that he's a fighter, man. He can, he can go. I mean, and you saw him take Tampa Bay. I mean, what, he wasn't even on the team two or three weeks prior to that game. And he took Tampa Bay to the Super Bowl champions to, to their limits. Uh, they, they only won by a score. Yeah. yeah, with the it's Washington the football great team, Tom yeah. Brady, the go and yeah. all of those and I, weapons. And he was yeah. doing and it I, all. He was doing stuff that you didn't expect of him, like running and hitting the pylon with a scrambling touchdown. You know what I mean? His team yeah. was hyped. You I'm said Chase you. Young was hyped after that. He's <laughs> a dog. Yeah. This is the kind of guy we're talking about that just he had he doesn't care about the numbers. How do we win? Do I exactly do I run the ball? Is that how we win? Then I'll run. Do I, you know, right. am I throwing check downs all the way to the goal line? Then that's how we win. He doesn't care. And uh, so that's, um, you know, that's really what, what, what I see in, in, in Taylor Heineke, man. He, he, can, he can go. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And, and, you know, there's guys on the other side of that spectrum that I think that Stafford kind of fits that mold perfectly that they got a lot of big empty numbers, you know, but they don't win anything. So yeah. nothing meaningful that is. And, and, my, um, you know, my thoughts too, you know, just crowning them champions. Didn't they just lose? Did they lose their D coordinator? Who went over to, uh, I think, who went over to the Chargers? Someone took like the Chargers head coaching job. I thought. I think that what? They've lost that? a few people. I know they lost yeah, they, uh, uh, one of their uh, coaches to the Seattle Seahawks, who's our new offensive coordinator. Yeah, so, Van Waldron, yeah. Yep. Yeah, Austin hasn't stopped talking about what a Hall of Famer he's going to be since he got signed. <laughs> but uh, he's Austin's new he's guy. He's going to take so. Pete's mantle. Yeah. That's oh, the. Yeah. <laughs> And then you look at San Fran, another team that had a very strong defense, just were lacking a little on offense. That's what they had in common with the Rams. They just lost their D coordinator. Now, I think yep. it's not going to take long uh, for D'Amico Ryans to, to be a great coordinator in this game. He was a phenomenal player. Oh, yeah. The, you know, he studied, studied the game more than a lot of guys. Um, great middle linebacker. <laughs> and um, But them losing Sala, that's, that's, that's really the, – that's tough when you lose your D coordinator that just – the last three, four years, Sala was taking them, you know, deep playoff runs and, and, you know, just being one of the most dominant forces out there on defense. Yeah, I, oh, think, a, I think a lot of fans don't realize how important consistency is with a team and with coaches. Continuity, all of it. And another thing that fans don't really, I think they know a little bit about, but maybe not necessarily all the ways injuries. And I was watching an interview with you before we went on the air today. You talked about 15 concussions and 10 surgeries you've had. Now, can you speak to that a little bit? Like, I don't think the average fan knows just how brutal the NFL is. They know it's it's hard hitting and everything, but 15 concussions and 10 surgeries, and you didn't have a 20 year career. So that's a lot of injuries within that short span there, right? Yeah, eight of my 10 surgeries in my life were from football. And, um, you know, they all came like right after that. Like the concussions, I had probably three or four. I mean, I think everybody remembers except for me, the Carolina one with Nick Goings. Yes. Um, in the it's NFC like a car wreck, man. <laughs> yeah, and I I look back, I don't know how I played through that. Um, you know, he, he went to the hospital. I don't I don't know if Nick played again after that um, or maybe one more season. But, I mean, those things have lingering effects. And 
what I didn't realize is how bad they were going to deteriorate the mind body connection that the athlete knows. And um, so it seemed like every year, and I never missed any time, even if I got one in the game, I was playing, I was back to practice that next Wednesday. Protocol was a little different back then, you know, uh, you still have to pass the test, but it wasn't, it wasn't as scrutinized as much or it wasn't washed over, you know, this closely. So, um, but then, you know, so you mean, could maybe pass with a D plus on the test is what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, you could definitely. Yeah. that's, that's yeah. What I'm But um, I mean, yeah, man, um, it's that. And you saw it with like Andrew Luck and Keekley when they retired early and, you know, I was proud of them. I commend, you know, commend them for doing that because they're still able to walk away. Like my last game, I got I got carried second to last game. I played the, played the following week against uh, Chicago. But uh, my last game, Beast Quake game uh, against the Saints when we were seven or nine, um, and we I had I got hit early in the first quarter, again in the second quarter. Um, I hit somebody else, and they got dinged up. But I knew I was not okay. And then me and Julius Jones, my old teammate, we collided at center field and just both just carried off the field like, and so. Um, like I said, I commend Keekley and some of these younger guys who are calling it quits earlier because they're seeing, you know, how the, the trauma and how it's long lasting. Um, that, well, I guess that's a good sign if they don't have quality CBD. Because <laughs> that's, that's ultimately what led me back to, you know, my, my best health right now. I feel better. But um, yeah, there's like the average fan, the, the, you know, that rehab time, man, those are some long, lonely hours. Like, oh, gosh. And, you want to talk about the psyche, the mental aspect, Dylan? Um, when you, you you already run a four eight, man, you know, and and now you're wondering how when you have two knee surgeries, how oh, am I gonna no. catch these guys now? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what what are the analysts gonna say about me now? <laughs> hey, Frisco, leave me alone. <laughs> So, yeah. so you are right, though, Lofa, that was a great segue um, as we, you know, get towards the end of this, uh, this thing here. Um, now, you had talked before about being 5'11 and 280 pounds um, after you had retired and said that you use CBD to replace everything else, including supplements, sleep aids, anti-inflammatories, and it changed your life. And, and I understand that you've got your part of zone in here. You've got the 1937 farms uh that you're kind of doing in your life after football so um can you tell us a little bit about that as someone who uh is definitely an avid fan of cbd and your 1937 farms <laughs> yeah. i'd love to hear more yeah it's just about shifting the stigma and and you know letting people know that cannabis and hemp even you know hemp is a cannabis plant i mean the only difference between cannabis marijuana and hemp is the varying amounts of THC, you know, industrial hemp has little to no THC. Um, but it's made one of the most incredible impacts on my life post football. Um, you know, my body just ravaged by all those injuries, you know, the scar tissue, everything. And I mean, I think the, the biggest part was the mental health and the emotional um, tie to it that that allows someone to stay on top of their game, to stay, you know, working out, making good decisions as what they eat, drink, you know, those nature, things of that nature. And like, I'm talking within a week, this stuff had me feeling like Superman again. <laughs> I mean, That's awesome. Yeah, I couldn't believe it. And so um, just to backtrack, me and my business partner, Matt McCoy, former Seahawk, um, we bought some property in the cannabis uh, sector um, and eventually we took over operations created our brand 1937 farms and this was around 2016 at, right after i got out of coaching in 16 so maybe early 17 but i was already taking cbd as early as 15 16 ish because i kept hearing more and more about cbd as opposed to thc and um, so i just kept doing research finding out what it is what it can do for me and eye-opening fellas like a life I never know. Um, just like I said, nothing phased. I'm, I'm zoned in, man. I can't be phased. And, you know, not mentally, not physically, emotionally. It's, you know, things happen and it's just how we react. And it's it's really helped me to react in 
in great fashion to anything that, that comes my way. Well, well and we'll- that's a really incredible to hear, especially as, you know, I, as to not bring up the gloom of it, but, you know, the story we just heard about a former NFL cornerback, you know, uh, what was it, a week, week and a half ago. Um, and, I mean, it's a very uh, you you guys to me are the modern day gladiators you know you you put your body on your on the line your well-being your physical and mental health on the line um for the entertainment of the masses you know and and not a lot of people appreciate that for what it is and so anything like you said the stigma behind it's crazy to me because anything that can help allow an athlete at that level to have that mental health and that well-being physically, spiritually, mentally, and everything else, um, it, it shouldn't be a problem, you know? And, and so I think it's incredible that you've been such a huge advocate for this and, and that you've uh, used your platform to, to really push it and, and you know, um, push it more into the mainstream, I guess you could say, you know? Yeah, I, but I, I owe my life, the life I know, the last four years of my life has been the best of my life. And I mean... A lot of people would say, oh, well, what about when you were going to Pro Bowls or winning national championships? Now, last four years of my life, I'm talking mentally, physically, and spiritually. I've never felt better. And it's because, so I owe my life to it. And even three years before I started Zone In, Zone In's like a year and a half old. Um, three years prior, <laughs> when um, I lost a bunch of weight, I just started feeling better than ever. I started handing out full spectrum oil, which is CBD. Yeah. to friends and family I'm like yeah you got to try this because i mean if if i had to list the issues that i dealt with and that it's you know help manage or cure fix like we'd be here all day fellas because it was <laughs> like i said i was 280 couldn't work out i you know used to stress eat um because that was one yeah. of my coping methods to, to stress it's i'm not chewing tobacco i chewed tobacco since i was 15 years old uh, I'm 38 now and I haven't chewed in like four years. That's and awesome, like, dude. I That's thought incredible. I, was, I tried to quit that so many times, fellas. And it's like the edge or the stress part of what induced it, the, the, the need or want for nicotine, it's like it just kind of subsided. It wasn't there anymore, it, you know? And um, man, it was, it was incredible. It's like I forgot. Really? Because I mean, like that's that's really what it comes down. Like I forgot that I was, you know, so um, attached or addicted to to uh, tobacco, chewing tobacco. A lifetime ago, yeah. Well, well Lofa, I do want to say that I, it really resonated with me your story about being five eleven and two eighty, because you know, as a, I've never played professional football, obviously, but my last ten years of my career, uh, professional wrestling, I've ravaged my body pretty bad and like over the quarantine i've ballooned up myself to like 270 so i'm 510 270 so i'm like right below you there so like hearing (laughs) your story about that but no joke like hearing your story about that i was like maybe this is something i should get into that i should look at because it's not just the physical either because i've had injuries surgeries whatever but it's also the mental that you're talking about that whole uh, stress eating, like I go through that too. And then with quarantine being isolated, it makes it even worse, man. Man, I'm telling you. And, and the, uh, a lot of it was too that uh, not only stress eating, you know, bad habits, which, you know, whatever your habits are, it's going to be your life, right? But I hurt too much to like go to the gym. And like mm-hmm. when I went one day, I was on the shelf for like a week. Done. And yeah. We can all relate to that. But then I started taking it. It has to get in your system. So that's why I said within a week, I noticed right away my, my mood swings are not there anymore. Because I got some, I had some pretty bad mood swings from the concussions. Um, and I was like, man, you know, even just looking outside, I'm like, man, I'm grateful to be here. This is a beautiful day. And it was like pouring outside. You know, most people <laughs> complain about the rain. I was like, yo, we're 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 blessed to be here. And uh, so I'm talking, it was a full lifestyle change. And one that I really, ha- I just, I took it because I thought it was going to like help my knees feel better. I thought I was like, I could get back active a little bit. And I'm telling you, it just, and it's also, it works to keep you in balance. So what it's done for me from the appetite suppression side of things is I eat until I'm full, which is like a plate, maybe a plate and a half. I used to eat like three or four plates. I mean, I used to throw food down, right? So 
I mean, it's crazy what it does because it, it responds to our cells, our cell receptors in our brain and our body, CB1 and CB2. And there's a, there's a whole ecosystem in there called the endocannabinoid system that it, you know, the plant interacts um, in a positive way on many levels, uh, inflammation, um, stress, anxiety, um, just sleep, uh, gut health, pain tolerance and pain sensation. There are, it's every vitamin or whatever that I, I took before that they told me was like, yo, this is what it's gonna do for you. I went through bottles because you have to go through a supplement for a while for a whole thing. I hate it when people like try one or you know come back to it a couple of days later. They're like, ah, oh, that shit didn't work. It's like, man, you didn't even give it a time to get in your system. But right. once it gets into your system, you know, it's it's not that I'm moving pain free. Those pains or those those scars and the scar tissue is still there, but I'm moving. I feel like more mechanically efficient than I ever have. And you know, that's strange to say at 38 compared to when you were in the NFL at 25. Maybe come line up next to Bobby and KJ for a season or Ooh, <laughs> short yards and goal line. <laughs> That's like, That's what... I don't want to run anymore. Short yards and goal line. <laughs> right. Special, special to Tupu package. Goal line go. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. That's it. So so Lofa, we're getting getting to the end of our time here. And and we do appreciate all of the time that you have allowed for us. Uh, man, it Again, total dream come true, and it's awesome. You got to tell us where we can find this stuff, though. Where can we Absolutely. find Zone In? Where can we find 1937 Farms? And where can we listen to your Seahawks podcast, of course? Well, there's a lot of where can and how. Um, <laughs> so, you got a lot of stuff going on. I did my research. <laughs> Zone In CBD. I appreciate it, man. Zone In CBD. You can learn more at our website, e-commerce, zoneincbd.com. And um, we just released – a pre-workout energy mix that, I mean, I think you'll be pretty excited about. It is how I describe it to people. When I take it, I feel like Bradley Cooper and Limitless when I go into my business. Nice. Meetings. And it's then, very specific. And, right. then, yeah. and then when I go into the gym, I feel like Ronnie Coleman going for another Mr. Olympia. So, there you go. <laughs> it's a pretty, that's a pretty good selling point. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's, it's the best pre-workout I've ever had. No crash, no jitters packed with a bunch of vitamins, a B complex, a ton, ton of vitamin C to help uh, boost the immune system too. Um, and then we have uh, three other products, oils and the capsules and um, a muscle rub uh, roll on that, that's incredible. And so zoneincbd.com, that's where you can find it. And if you're in the Seattle area or near a Bartels drugs, we're in uh, all 67 locations there. Um, 1937 farms we're in select retail locations now that is plus 21 plus for anybody out there listening um, that is the actual cannabis and we, we we major in flower it's a small small grow tier two and um, which we you know we could be expanding um, there might be a, a chance to expand to, to bigger uh, canopy space or greenhouses here in the near future and then Seahawks pod it's on the believe network it's in Believe is spelled B L E A V, um, Believe podcast, and it's Believe in Seahawks. Uh, if you look up my name or Brett Davern, you'll find us there. And uh, so, yeah, a lot going on. That on top of being a fourth grade math teacher and uh, and a kindergarten math teacher for my, <laughs> we're homeschooling, man. Well, there you go. That's I, awesome, I, man. Yeah, yeah that's that awesome. is awesome. Good for a you. A lot going on. What what's harder? Uh, dissecting an NFL offense or being a fourth grade math teacher? <laughs> I haven't done math in a long time, but I'm pretty, I was, that was my best subject. So I was pretty excited when my wife was like, Hey, this is what you're going to be teaching. Uh, she's got, she's got the other ones. Cause yeah, words always confuse me. I was more of a diagram. I thought the playbook was so easy to read. Numbers guy. Yeah. yeah That's I'm a numbers awesome. Guy. Lofa. Right. Once again, I want to thank you on behalf of Austin and triple overtime for joining us. It has been an absolute pleasure. I learned a lot. I'm definitely going to check out zone in cbd myself personally anybody out there who's Absolutely. experiencing the same problems the same issues so check it out as well and i just want to thank you so much for your time and all you've done for the seahawks and just the years of entertainment you provided for austin myself and i and other seahawks fans out there brother and and before we get out of here lofa you got to give us one crazy marshawn lynch story from your time in the locker room with him i don't marshawn's pretty chill i mean he he has that personality but in the building, you know, he's about he's about his business. Um, what what do I have from Marshawn? Um, 
when he first got here, he um, we were we were talking because you know I played him at Cal, and then we played him when he was in Buffalo, and they they beat us in Buffalo pretty good actually. He had a pretty good day. He broke like a forty yarder, and um, there was a discrepancy between me and him. He was like he's like yeah I ran right over you. I was like the f- you did. Like, <laughs> we'll go up there right now and go we'll watch the tape. And so uh, we watched the tape, and I had a couple good hits on him, and I was just rewinding them for him. I was like, Take that. <laughs> and then, uh, and then we got to the play that he was talking about, and we were in an all-out blitz, and I sealed my gap, but he ran like right off of my back, mm-hmm. and and so I was like, yeah, it's not even my gap, and he was like, man, that's right on, that's right on you. <laughs> But I mean, he had like 130, 140, that, some, something like something crazy that day. And uh, him and Fred Jackson were going off. They, that was a tough squad. Oh, yeah. Marshawn, well, I'm happy to hear. Well, I'm, happy, I'm happy to hear that you and Marshawn argue about the same kind of stuff that my brother and I argue about when we play Madden, you know? Right. There's no way you did that. Like, <laughs> I, I'm telling you, Marshawn probably could have been a Hall of Fame linebacker, too. I mean, that. Yeah, that, dude. I can speed. believe it. His vision and hit, the way he hits, like just the leg strength and you know drive. When you hit him, it's it's like a brick wall, man. Um, so is that that was you know the best acquisition you know to date, right? When we traded for that guy. And then, oh yeah, it's got to be up there with the best Seahawks acquisitions ever by trade. Oh yeah, I would think just what he brought to the team and the spirit and everything. But but we know you got to run, Lofa. I want to thank you once again for being here with us. You know, everybody check out Zone and CBD. Check out 1937 Farms. Check out the Seahawks pod. Go follow Lofa on Instagram. Do what you got to do. But thank you so much, Lofa. We'll hopefully talk to you again real soon, brother. Thank you. Right on. Have a good one, Lofa. Thank you so much, man. Hey, you. Yeah, you. Enjoying triple overtime? Do you like hearing about professional wrestling as well? Well, then we have the show for you. From the makers of Triple Overtime as part of the Deal Industries Worldwide YouTube channel comes May I Take This Bump. Tag team partners Dylan Devine and Matt Ecstatic relive their glory days and talk about the latest dealings in professional wrestling. All right, we are back. I am at a loss for words. That was amazing. An hour with Lofa Tatsupu, never in our wildest dreams when we started this show, did we think. And we got to give the credit to our main man, Austin, over here. He is the guest seeker i don't really know what this position is called i like to think of uh, myself as the dan patrick of the show and he's the todd fritz who goes and gets the guests that's what todd fritz does on dan patrick's show so sure. yeah sure. you just got just shave that. just shave your head dude yeah then you'll be yeah. the new fritz the better show. looking fritzy you know i don't know man <laughs> we're gonna have to have fritzy on the show someday see yeah, if uh, yeah, you guys I'll, can I'll go one-on-one on one. hit him up on instagram Look out for fritzy. <laughs> i don't know if he's got instagram but yeah <laughs> But Austin, what did you think of the interview with Lofa Tatupu, man? Just super exciting, man. I'm so thankful that he took the time and, and not just the time, but so much of it, you know, when, uh, when I originally got confirmation from him that he'd be okay doing the YouTube show with us. I was thinking maybe we'd get 15, 20 minutes max, you know, and for him to give an hour of his time to us. Um, he's just such a busy guy between his uh, CBD and cannabis uh, businesses um ventures as i was gonna say um and, full-time and, father as well yeah, you talked about father, homeschooling his kids now homeschooling. yeah i mean all of it man you know and, and so the, that's so cool that we got a full hour of his time to just and he was and, the, and the, the biggest thing is he was a really nice guy which you don't always find in this business you know uh austin i've interviewed uh quite a few people in different levels you know from professional to collegiate to below uh, as a sports journalist so far on my journey to doing this full time and like you don't always get someone who's that personable who's that nice who's that generous with their time you know right. and he he had you know like you said he didn't have to do the show and he did and it was amazing that he did it for us and uh you know hopefully we get to see him again sometime yeah, yeah, that'd be incredible. I'd love to have him back. Lofa, you are always welcome on the show. Um, you are always welcome to, to reach out to, to me at any time. If, uh, uh, if you ever want to come back, uh, we've always got a warm seat for you, man. So thank you again so much for the time that you spent with us um, and, uh, and allowing us to get some insight on you and, and your mind and what you got going on and everything. It's just super cool, man. Super cool. 
All right, Austin. Can't say wanna... enough good things about the guy. You know, that's <laughs> we can do a whole nother hour just on this. So uh, easily. Austin, easily. Austin, you want to go ahead and get us out of here then? And absolutely, uh, if do you it. haven't already. Uh, if you are a triple OG and you are watching the end of this video, meaning you watched everything from start to finish, make sure you hit like, subscribe, drop a comment, join in on the conversation. Let us know. Let Lofa know what's going on. You know, if you got any questions for Lofa, make sure to drop them in. He might swing by the comment section himself. You never know. So, but as always, I'm Austin. That's Dylan for Triple Overtime. And thank you guys so much for tuning in. Peace.